Good afternoon and welcome to our 16th episode of Slow Living, a webinar series driven by sustainability rooted in community. Today, it is my honor to welcome Dr. Carl Hager as our guest speaker. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Dr. Hager is a physical oceanographer and a marine mammal acquisition with over 30 years of underwater acoustic and field research experience. Dr. Hager serves as a professor with the US, served as a professor with the US Naval Academy's Oceanography Department for 10 years. He is currently a faculty member with CU Boulder's Natural Science First Year Academic Experience. He is also a lecturer for CU Boulder's Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, also known as ATOC Department, and Global Science First Year Academic Experience. Dr. Hager's current courses include meteorology, oceanography, tropical marine ecology, and climate science. On this week's episode, Dr. Hager will be discussing the challenges of teaching undergraduate climate science in an era of polarized politics and how we can bridge that gap. So before I give Dr. Hager the floor, I'd like to remind the audience that we'll have a Q&A section at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please send them in the chat box and I will call on you to ask Dr. Hager specifically uh, your question at the end of his presentation. So without further ado, the floor is all yours. Excellent, Kevin, thanks for having me. Is it possible to see those in attendance? It is, yes. We have two attendees right now and we are waiting for a few more to show up. Not a problem at all, just stop. And you should be able to see them on the participant side at the lower edge bar. Uh, let's see, I've got to... I'm actually only seeing you, Kevin, on that. Okay. Is it because I'm sharing? Do you want me to stop sharing and go? Oh, no, it's quite all right. Um, if, yeah, if you want to stop sharing, you could certainly uh, reach out, but they can actually see your link to the video in the chat box. Oh, okay. I just didn't, it would be great to interact with them. I didn't, I'm not, for some reason, I'm not able to see their pictures. So I can certainly unmute them, but I don't believe that their videos will be um, on. Oh, okay. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. Participants, attendees. All right. Jeffrey, Rachel, and Victoria. Welcome, guys. There's Jeffrey. Now I'm seeing it. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Cheers, you guys. Jeffrey, Rachel, and Victoria, are you local? Uh, Jeff is in Boulder. Oh, brilliant. And your background, sir? Uh, astrophysics. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> do, you, do you teach here, Jeff? No, no, I do not. Okay, awesome. And where, where's astrophys astrophysics is your background? What, where are you employed? I work for NASA now. Brilliant. Um, my final slide, uh, second to final slide is, is the NASA webpage. And, All right, and, I'll look forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Rachel. Hey. Are you local? I am local, yes. Fantastic. And your background? What, what brings you to the, to the discussion today? Well, Kevin's one of my great friends. Um, but I grew up with him, um, but I actually work as a BDE for a CBD company out here in Denver, Colorado. Brilliant. Thanks for, thanks for coming in. Of course. Victoria, you're, are you local? Hi, yes, I'm in, I'm in Denver. Okay, brilliant. And your, your, your background, what brings you into the discussion today? I'm a graphic designer and I'm actually the graphic designer for RYM. Kevin's my partner, so I do all of the design work for the brand. Oh, brilliant. Well, welcome you guys on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. And Kevin, thanks for having me. Of course, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, cheers. I'm gonna share a screen and um, I wanna take you guys through uh, a little bit of the interesting challenges that this political environment has on teaching climate science. Uh, I, I've taught at CU to some small sections of 20 people and I've taught at CU in some larger sections of 350 
students as well. And it's interesting that the, the backgrounds that individuals bring into the discussion. And I wanted to just in a kind of a seminar format, uh, get your feedback on, on what you've experienced with this strikingly politically uh, uh, divisive topic of, of climate change. And, uh, and we'll continue from there. So, all right, so this is what I, I give you a little bit of background on my, my, my research and, and what I've done before. There's a five minute intro for a one hour video that I'd like you to watch. Uh, Dr. Stephen Hayward uh, was a uh, invited and visiting uh, conservative thought scholar uh, that delivered a presentation in 2014. It's pretty striking um, and it ties into some of the topics I'm gonna to talk about a little bit later of sowing mistrust, um, political bundling, and, and really a, a mockery that, that has served very, very well uh, to fuel the insurgency against climate scientists. Uh, and that's the interesting voice that I'm talking about. And really what we're seeing in that um, different universe is a rewriting and a reapproach for the scientific method. Uh, we're really kind of abandoning that in those circles. And I, I'd, I'd love to get your feedback and how you feel about that. And then I'm gonna take you right to the nitty gritty. Um, and we have uh, an astrophysicist, Jeffrey here with us today that works for NASA. I will tell you over and over again, who do you trust? I trust NASA. Who does NASA trust? NASA trusts the AGU, all these scientific communities, all the scientific committees, they trust them. And they've got a very eloquent, um, the climate change website with the evidence and, and the potential consequences or the consequences. We don't necessarily have to say potential. And then I'd, I'd love to send a link to you uh, on someone who is an absolute brilliant pioneer and, and the two things that I most value within science is compassion and intellect. And, uh, and I think if we can really go back to those those sharp individuals that, that bring us back to what is this all about? It really is environmental stewardship. It has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with taking care of our planet. This is my background um, in the middle. I, I married up. Uh, this is my wife, my, my son, Jake, my daughter, Katie. Uh, Jake is proof that uh, what happens in Vegas doesn't necessarily stay in, stay in Vegas, but moved into Moved to Colorado about seven years ago, taught at the Naval Academy as a permanent military professor. I'm a physical oceanographer, a um, marine mammal acoustician by trade, um, but I also did some Arctic research as well. So um, my recommendation to you, if you do consider research in, in any area, go for the tropics. The Arctic was crazy. I was up in Alaska, the, the furthest part of, furthest village in Alaska to the north within the United States and uh, 40 below during the day, even colder at night. Um, my master's work was with blue whales and their vocalizations, modeling their vocalizations. It's striking. You can hear these animals across an entire ocean basin. This is the blue whale com communicates with the loudest sound of every of any animal on the planet about 180 dB RE1 micropascal. It's a different reference from an air reference that's in 20 micropascals. And then my doctoral work, I worked with adonisites and their detection ranges as well. Because initially we were concerned in the Navy um, about insonifying and intimidating and potentially causing uh, mortality for these larger baleen whales and it shifted to the smaller whales with the beaked whales when they ended up washing up on a shoreline. When I talk about insonifying, it's this Navy sonar that's put out into the water to find a submarine that we found it was pretty dangerous. Logically, it's dangerous. Blue whale, largest animal that's ever lived, can increase its volume by six times. This thing looks like a tadpole. There's only 5% of the original population and populations of blue whale left. We weren't able to hunt this whale until the steamships came around. You can't hunt these blue whales with a ship of sail because they can travel up to 25 miles an hour. In fact, a, a fin whale is considered the, gray, uh, the greyhound of the ocean because it travels so fast, but absolutely massive. The largest animal that ever lived was 106 
feet long. It was a female. We slaughtered her in the Southern Ocean. It's really striking, isn't it? You can see these two blowholes for that massive whale. Again, it is a, you can call it kind of a, a baleen filter feeder. It swims into a collection or, or patch of krill prey, um, surrounds it, and then collects that prey with a fingernail type of baleen is what we refer to it. And then that the strong tongue kind of draws that, that prey off of the, off the baleen plates and then it forces the water out. In fact, when killer whales go after blue whales, they look to slaughter them and eat the tongue. It's like the filet mignon of, of the blue whale. It's the loudest sound, as I said, produced by any animal. And what's striking about this is that the species name matches the household mouse. So you got Moose musculus is a house mouse, and then you got Baleoptera musculus, which is a blue whale. So I don't know if that was a, a, uh, a little bit of a joke that was injected into that blue whale, but very cool. So um, I wanted to get your feedback on what you see in this image. Any, any thoughts on that, Jeff, Rachel, or Victoria? Any thoughts at all? You do, Victoria, you said you were in media. You do PR? I'm actually, quickly, I'm having a little trouble seeing the screen. I'm not sure um, if it's something on my end, but the shared screen is very small. Kevin, you want me to stop and disengage? Yeah, what we could do is just reshare it. So yeah, you could stop the presentation and then uh, re-enter it and just see if that's gonna help. Okay. Because everything's looking fine on my end. Um, and Jeffrey suggested it looked good on his end as well. Okay. Um, Victoria, does that look better for you? So it's still good for me. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeffrey. I'll, I'll just say that, yes, this common perception that will ignore the weather or focus too much on the weather when we're really talking about the climate and cater our image or our message to whatever we, the facts of the day. That's a perception I see out there too often. Yeah, brilliant, um, Jeff. Is it Jeff or Jeffrey, sir? Uh, Jeff, Jeff is perfect, thanks. Okay. Brilliant, thank you for injecting, absolutely. And I think what's striking is the stereotypes that are that have really proven successful in, in holding on to for a long time. Look at this far left stereotype that we have here. I, I wear broken socks myself, sometimes in the winter with socks. But you can see that we've got a we've got an individual who represents the left on the right side, and he's uh, sleeveless, wearing shorts and Birkenstocks with socks. He's, uh, he's got a ponytail. And, and, and not only that, is we've got this in all caps. So what we're seeing here is a meme. And, and memes are very, very powerful. In fact, I think for uh, different generations, uh, these memes serve as a tickling of inherent biases really just kind of tickle you. In fact, the algorithms that exist in social media will feed these memes to you, as will your campfire, right? We talk about different campfires and we go to that campfire politically based upon a single issue. And then within the discussions of those campfires, we are fed some interesting information. And these memes serve as a very powerful tool in tickling those biases and really enhancing and, and, and uh, securing those synaptic networks that, that make people very opinionated on that. And as Jeff, as you brought up, this is an oversimplification of the process. And the, the climate itself is a very, very complex system. It is a coupled system. It is an atmospheric and ocean and, and cryosphere coupled system. And there are a lot of oscillations that exist out there. But what we're looking at on this left-hand side and kind of a summary of all these, these, these formulas and, and, and really redefining what we're talking about here 
is anthropogenic inputs. Anthropogenic impacts on our climate and what's going on. To simplify it by calling it weather it is really a, a, a gross simplification here. So here's what I'd like you to watch. Um, this is Stephen Hayward. He gives a presentation at a to a conservative audience after um, spending some time at Boulder as a resident scholar. They invited him in as a uh, conservative scholar. And I, I wanted you to watch this video. And here's the, the image for the video. And, and please, I'm going to send it to you for, via link. Listen to the first five minute, minutes of this, and then I'll have us regroup. I don't want to um, display it over, play it over the um, my screen because there may be a little bit of a lag. So I think I, if I still have it here, Kevin, let's do that. There we go. Ah, oh, that was to Kevin, sorry. Let's put it out to everybody. All right, so there is a link to it. Take, take five minutes to listen to the very first part of this and then we'll, we'll regroup.
All right, if I could, if I could pull you back, it, it continues on. Um, obviously, and I, and I welcome you to, to watch the uh, remainder of the video. But if I could pull you back for a moment, um, any, any thoughts right off the bat of what happened there or what's going on there? Rachel, were you able to get a, um, a a better picture going now? Yeah, here, hold on. I'm like trying to get it off of. Victoria, I throw it out to you. Your thoughts on the video. I guess I'm still trying to decipher exactly his direction. I think I would, of course, need to see it in its entirety. But he seems, as a conservative, I can't tell if he has taken to you know the other side of kind of the politics of it and was convinced during his time in Boulder or if he's still skeptical um it's hard to tell kind of for me right now where he lands any, that, were there any comments that he made that that kind of stuck with you as um, unique um well some of the terms he was using and uh I'm trying to think of the the, the climate. Um, he kind and of like this. group, yes. Yeah. Thermageddonites. Right, yeah, thermageddonites. I think some of those terms definitely, like I had never heard before. <laughs> and what do, what do you think those, why would you label someone that? Uh, climatista, thermageddonite. Well, it definitely holds a connotation. I think even if you're not completely educated on the issue that those terms when there's even the tone that's used kind of makes them sound a bit negative Alarm. or alarmist, right? Yeah. Right, extreme. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, there's some, what you're witnessing within the first, and, and some because he's talking to his audience. He is in a conservative audience mm -hmm. and, he, and he is absolutely tickling that known bias in front of him. And, uh, but what's interesting is that he does it pretty effectively. In fact, during a lot of the presentation in those first six minutes, he pauses and you can hear the laughter in the background, can't you? Mm -hmm. and, and even the term comic misadventure is something that's really striking to me. Um, Rachel, any, any thoughts on what I kind of had the same thoughts as Vic. Um, I wanted to like get into it more because I couldn't see, figure out his direction. Okay. Um, he kind of just seemed like unbiased, but you can tell he was talking to a very conservative group because I did hear the laughs a little bit too. So I was just trying to figure out like his angle and where he, I, I'm really like, I actually really wanted to watch the rest of it after this because I'm, I'm intrigued to see where it's going to go. Now he did give a summary of the uh, kind of a template of where it was going to go. Remember he talked about the three points that he is going to identify as a funny thing happened on the way to global warming. Is it number one, do you remember what number one was? Number one was that temperatures weren't rising anymore. Yeah, it stopped, right? He refers to it as a pause. And so, and, and, and really we're gonna start there and, and I'm gonna pull up a couple of things that I pulled from this. I've, I've shown this in a number of guest lectures before, but uh, listen to the slides, listen to the branding um, that was injected into his first five minutes. He, he talked about good to be back in normal America. He recently survived as an inmate at CU Boulder and, and boulders like Berkeley with snow. And he said, and he, and he really said something that struck me. He says, Conservative loves, conservatives love Boulder. We love it for the green belt that's around it. It makes the quarantine so much easier to enforce. In fact, when liberals try to escape, we round them up hand them a, a bag of fresh organic kale and send them back to the village. This is no different than the individual with the ponytail wearing the Birkenstocks with the socks, is it not? So what we've done is we've, we're, we're perpetuating a stereotype and I, and I understand you're tickling a biased crowd, um, but this is a, a, a verbal equivalent of a meme, you guys. And, it, and um, so if I continue on here a little bit, it's perfectly fine to us if you wreck Boulder, Madison, Cambridge, and Berkeley, if the rest of America is relatively safe. We've got five Nobel Prize winners at, at CU Boulder. I, um, I think there's a little bit more 
than uh, just crazy liberal talk. Uh, and then he goes on to say, decades from now, I think historians are likely to look back on the hysteria over climate change. Today, the way we today look back on prohibition. The envir environmental movement, which is deeply uh, authoritarian at its core, has an unquenchable will for power that cannot be satisfied and cannot be denied. So these are the points that set the template for the remainder of his presentations. Three things happened on the way to global warming. He was actually, uh, it was a, the name came off of a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. And he, I think he was talking about Zero Mosdell, who was an actor that played in uh, Fiddler on the Roof. And in, on Broadway, that actor did the funny thing happened on the way to the forum. But he said, first, the warming stopped. Now, if you listen to that video clip right there, when he said the warming stopped, did you hear the laughter? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I know. That's where I noticed it, actually. Yeah, that was struck. And there was a, there was a dramatic pause there, and, and even in his voice inflection. So what's really striking is that just, again, simplify it and say, <laughs> it stopped. It stopped based upon this pause, the warming stop. And he even said, imagine that. Secondly, the policy agenda of the climatistas, as I call them, wonderful branding, stereotyping, or even better term for the climate crusaders as Thermogedonites, has been revealed to be completely absurd based upon his campfire, correct? And said, and, and even injected, let's quit arguing about the science. It's really tedious. Jeffrey, I'm, I'm certainly, um, I, I, and I'm certain you consider science tedious as well and, and a bit confusing. I'm, I'm being facetious there. And then the third, the revival- And of the I'm an inmate as well, yes. I'm sorry, Jeffrey. Jeff? And I'm, a, I'm a fellow inmate. Yeah. <laughs> so the third, the revival of the oil and gas energy sector through the technological revolution of directional drilling. What's striking about this is we, we emblazon these alarmist labels Armageddonites, Climatistas, Trotskyites, right? You know, it's just all these, all these different things. And look at how gently the term fracking is treated. And he calls it rock massaging. Okay, so I, this really practiced his crowd very well. And, and one of the things that's striking, and, and Jeff, you know this, this would not stand in any scientific conference going off on, especially when you make assumptions or even make declarations that something, something has stopped or something is continuing or increasing or it doesn't make sense without some sort of scientific credibility or uh, empirical data. So I, again, we're injecting mistrust on the scientific community. The science is tedious. We're injecting mistrust on these new fangled climate computer models. So this is, a, this is a powerful thing that we're fighting. And, and I, I throw it out to the group. Where did this insurgency come from? What is the benefit of this insurgency? For me personally, uh, him denoting certain you know, aspects, certain cities, certain institutions in order to benefit his own agenda or his viewpoints that's where that name calling comes into play because it denotes their progressive nature. It denotes their academic um, prestigiousness. Whereas for his own sake, it's making himself and his credibility within his following um, look more applicable. But why, Kevin, why? Who would want this overwhelming empirical evidence to be discredited. So for, I mean, going off my own personal knowledge and research, it goes down to short-term gain of certain industries and individuals um, greed as in their own professionalism or their certain gains. And we, we don't even have to throw greed in there. We could just say capitalistic gain. And, and I'm, yeah. I'm really, I, I use the term uh, uh, capitalism just and not to inject any any departure from that at all, but it, it is it's a market driven society that we live in, and the 
the benefit and the seduction of, of affordable oil and gas is very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. So I, I, I really am gonna throw it out right now. Um, the injection of this mistrust within these political climates, these polarized political climates is really a result of an industry that would not benefit from elevated environmental protections, elevated restrictions, or even carbon taxes internationally. Comments from anyone? Jeff, am I a mock base here? My, my, I was just gonna say, follow the money. And, uh, and where is the money, Jeff? Kevin said it more eloquently than I did. Uh, yeah, it's the status quo of burning carbon, fossilized fuel extraction, et cetera, and not so much thinking about where other jobs could be, uh, where new, new, uh, new capitalist gains could come from a green revolution wouldn't have to be the status quo. Absolutely. And what's striking, I, I like what you said, um, and I agree that Kevin put that eloquently, it, is you follow the money, where is the money? Okay, there's money, but where's the money going? Where's the money going? It's going into the lobbies and where's the lobby going? It's, it's, it's going into the political candidate that's going to support that the best. Now, I wanna do a little bit of a drill with you guys. Um, I put the time on here. This is the camp firing that I was talking about because in our society, we have very impassioned single issue voters, don't we? Even within our families, there's division within our families on, I feel I'm a, I'm a fiscal conservative. Um, you know, I wanna, I'm gonna lower taxes. I wanna, I wanna, uh, I'm looking for the federal deficit to go down. What are some, what are some real sensitive, I didn't, I didn't say the most sensitive ones out there, but what are some that drive people into different campfires? Anybody wanna throw something out? I'll do the first one. abortion. Does everyone agree that this is a, a very, very sensitive and aggressively divisive um, issue with voters? Abortion was the first one I thought of. Yeah. Same and with me. Do you agree that I put onto the red camphor, I put pro-life and into the blue camphor, I put pro-choice? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Any other ones? <laughs> Anything else out there that, that people are really um, hot on? Um, I'll do another one. Second Amendment. Again, I'm, I'm really... Now, I'm not talking about the a la carte. So I'm not talking about the, the moderates that would potentially build their own collective platform by bouncing back and forth. I'm, I'm saying this is the, the challenge that we have now as voters is that, man, you've got to get into one campfire, you've got to get into the other campfire, correct? All right, so we've got gun control and 2A. Anything else? I'm curious where you think this lies, but choice of vaccination. Ooh. Okay. Um, and again, I don't want to. I don't want to label too much on this. I. What would you say? I, so do you just go anti-vax here. I'm not, again. I'm not. I. I don't want to. I don't want to drive this into mm -hmm. red bad, blue good, blue exactly. bad, red good. So yeah. I think that. Um, it's just primarily, predominantly where that lies within the majority. Um, yeah, I would, that's why I was specifically asking that question is because I feel like it's a little bit more uh, multifaceted and it's a little bit more of a complicated one. Yeah, it is. And I'm, and I kind of want to inject that into science altogether. And that, that's kind of the, the, the punchline of this, 
discussion. But some of the other ones that are out there, I, I think integration, you know, so we've got stronger immigration, I'll put I am in here. And then more open borders. I, I, when I say more, I would say not as aggressively restrictive on um, on borders. Anything else throw, jump out at you? Kind of with a sigh today that I say it may boil down to who we think won the election. Wow, we could do that. Um, uh, it, it's striking. Uh, I just put injecting mistrust into this scenario here. And, and thanks, Jeff, we're certainly there. Mistrust of, wow, I mean, a, a, a lot of things. And, and I guess we could really kind of work our way into this. Um, and I'll just put trust here. And so what I'm, this is kind of the, the punchline as we're working through this, the big summary is Here's what happens and here's what has happened in our society is that we are driven by single issues to a specific campfire. And I'm gonna put in here climate and we can put voting and it maybe blow my screen here. I am passionately against abortion. Passionate, passionate, passionate. So what do I do? I join the campfire that supports my agenda. I choose the party that supports my single issue narrative. Once I'm in that campfire, so this is what brought me in. Guess what they're talking about at the campfire? Gun rights, stronger immigration, lower taxes, and mistrust of climate, of science, um, this is powerful stuff. This is that political bundling that I was talking about when I introduced um, that section of this presentation. It's just like Comcast. You get your internet, you get your, your, your landline. If you still use a landline, you get your, your cell phone service. All this stuff is packaged together. So what we have had happen very tragically in this country is a separation, a polarization based upon all these issues. And unfortunately, they're forced into either campfire. And in this environment, it's, it's almost like what's happening throughout the United States as well, is that we're moving into neighborhoods of shared political beliefs and some of those non-urban areas. And it's powerful. So within those campfires, within specifically those social media campfires where you have algorithms that will target memes in there to tickle that known bias. Because why? I tell you, you are not going to be elected within the red if you feel this way, if you're against these single issues. It's the same thing for the blue. And it's unfortunate because we've lost that a la carte moderate bridge on so many of these topics, maybe a little gun control or, hey, let's, let's find a, a middle ground for uh, pro-life, pro-choice. Let's find a, a fiscal responsibility that has an equitable uh, balance of a, a tax burden. There are a lot of things that would really, now I'm a utopian by nature, you guys, I apologize, I'll speak that right off the bat. But I think it's important that we recognize why are these stereotypes being maintained? Where are they being shared? And how are they being shared? And social media is, is just a, a damning and, and, and caustic uh, catalyst for that. Thoughts is before I move on here a little bit. I'm not looking for an amen or anything. I, I appreciate any of your, your, your critical um, analysis as well. I agree with it. Um, I mean, everything you say, like, it's so unfortunate how it's just become split on like 100% on both sides. Uh, no, no Republican can win if they're com like, if they're for the opposite cause, like you have to be 100% in or 100% out. It's just, it is unfortunate. 
Um, and so I agree with everything you say and it, it's, it sucks though too. Yeah, and, and truly let's look at the smoking gun. I'm just putting oil in here, you guys. This is an industry that, that recognizes and wants to stay in business. And this is the challenge with our country right now. It is no doubt that there are new technologies that can extract fuel out of the ground, those fossil fuels out of the ground. Um, there are tar sands up in Canada that they're, they're laying waste to the environment um, in the extraction there, but this is a cheap way to keep us in a fossil fuel alliance. We are separated from an alliance. And this is the one thing that I agree with him 100%, Dr. Hayward is that this is a striking revolution. We have no reliance for, for fuel, fossil fuels overseas now. We are independent with that. So that's the biggest challenge that we have right now, especially when you can pay around $2 for gas and understand how that can impact the, the transportation industry, so many other industries out there that rely upon it. And, and, and it's, and it's a personal issue as well, right? especially if you have a large gas tank. So let's talk about climate and weather real quick. And again, please don't hesitate to inject any comments, discussion, or, or disagreements. Now, there is a distinct difference between climate and weather. Weather is the state of the atmosphere at a given time, and climate is the average weather. All right, so this is an important image. What you're looking at is a probability occurrence on the vertical axis, on the horizontal axis, we've got colder temperatures on the left, we've got hotter temperatures on the right. So you're looking at two distributions. One is a distribution that shows cold over here. So here's the coldest temperature. And it's just like a bell curve when you take an exam, right? So you, most of the people would, would fall into maybe the, the 75 to 85, right about here. But you would have a mean associated with that that um, exam. And then you get some really superstars that are getting 100 on your exams, but the bulk are here. So this is a, a distribution of those temperatures over a year. So what we're seeing now is a shift in that distribution to the right. So that's why when you see any of these um, images that show temperatures, they're delivered in temperature anomalies. Okay, it's plus, or plus 0.5, it's plus one, it's plus two. Temperature anomalies in the ocean, temperature anomalies in atmospheric temperature as well. So we're shifting those statistical limits to the right. Okay, so when we talk about climate change, we're talking about a anthropogenic or man-made induced shifting of that distribution. Okay, so. The little rectangle that you see up there is the pause that Dr. Hayward was talking about. Okay, this is an example of not addressing trends at 30,000 feet. So what has happened is it's an example of scientific cherry picking, correct? So I've already come up with my, my results that I'm looking for. So I'm really gonna step away from collecting the data, analyzing the empirical data, and I'm gonna to go to the result that I want to see. And so in this pause, and it was called a pause, you could see it slowed down a little bit, but look at the overall trend. These aren't high school science club classes. This is NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, Berkeley Earth, NOAA, Japanese Meteorological Agency, the Met Office, the Hadley Center, Climatic Research Unit. This is what's shown on the climate front page of NASA. And, and Jeff knows that, absolutely. Let's look at empirical data. The hottest years on record globally, uh, this was a 2018 slide. Uh, 2019 fell into the top four as well. And we're on our way to something within that. So last five years. Again, this is that anomaly that I was talking about. We're moving that distribution to the right. Now, 
this is a nice image that talks about temperature, that reveals temperature anomalies. And this is the, all the areas within the earth. You've got America, Oceania, Africa, and Asia, and then Europe, and you have different cities. Here's Nepal, uh, Dominican Republic. And so what we're seeing are anomalies, the shifting of that distribution to the right. So watch up in the upper right, this plot of anomalies that I showed a moment ago is showing an upward trend. So the most critical aspect of what's happening right now is not long-term oscillations. And there are in fact, long-term oscillations out there. We refer to those as Milankovitch cycles. People talk about solar cycles and it's a natural cycle that happens those are on a different periodicity compared to what we're talking about today. We're only going back about 150 years. So really the introduction of the industrial revolution throwing fossil fuel emissions, specifically carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is playing a critical role in this. Obviously the change, uh, climate does change naturally, but the periodicities are significantly larger from 20,000 up to 400,000 years. So when you have a discussion with someone, they say, well, the climate's always changing. It's not changing as fast as it's changing now over a long scale. All right, so what is our evidence? This is a very famous curve. Uh, Mauna Loa is next to Mauna Kea, both volcanoes. In fact, Mauna Kea is the largest mountain on the planet. Kind of cool if you take the peak of Mauna Kea all the way down to the abyssal plain away from Hawaii, it's even larger in altitude, collective altitude than Everest. So this healing curve is showing that atmospheric carbon dioxide is increasing. You've got these small scale oscillations and these are the, 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 the pulsing, kind of the com uh, compression and rarefraction of carbon dioxide based upon the sequestration within the photosynthetic process. So when you have more plants out there for our deciduous trees, they're going to extract carbon dioxide out. When we go into the winter levels, you don't have that sequestration, you're not taking the carbon dioxide out um, and it's going to peak. So these are seasonal oscillations that you have and here's my overall trend that we're looking at. Okay. How does today's parts per million in carbon dioxide compare historically. And there are a number of proxy data sets out there that are very, very valuable. These ice cores are valuable as well. When ice forms, it encapsulates air bubbles. And within those air bubbles, we could determine what the atmospheric carbon dioxide was at the time. So when we have these 400 parts per million levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, and we look back about 800,000 years ago, when I say a proxy data set, it's approximate because there wasn't actually a measurement. What we do is we infer by extracting that carbon dioxide value from the ice bubble here. But look at this, this is absolutely striking. So if we compare this to geological time periods where there were um, glacial retreats and the Cretaceous period is a very powerful example of that. High carbon dioxide equates to higher atmospheric temperatures and reduced glaciers, ice sheets, and higher sea levels. So we're using that comparison from the past, the Cretaceous period, to say that and more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is going to increase our temperature. So that's a direct proportionality. The ice is going to go down. It's going to melt. That ice is injected and introduced into the water. And so we're looking at a systemic global increase in sea level as well. So you may have heard the discussion about 97%. And there are a number of papers that are out there that uh, did summaries of abstracts to find out basically the overall opinion of these scientists that were doing these studies. Hey, are we playing a role in this? We being humans, right? There's a Jay Cook et al. 2016, I uh, did another one in 2013. I'm going in, in reverse order here. Um, and a number of, of other ones as well. So what you're looking at are an assessment based upon the research that was done by climate scientists. They believe that 
humans are playing a role in climate change. Okay, so when we graph those amounts within these papers, it's pretty striking. So within these abstracts, these climate scientists are saying humans are playing a significant role in global warming. And then there's a small population that is saying that it's little or not. So this is what's interesting. And this is the tool of cherry picking that individuals can use very, very seductively in the right campfire. I use the term cherry picking. So even when faced with overwhelming consensus right here, cherry pickers can go in, find a researcher that is contradicting the overwhelming consensus, have it delivered. And you'll find this on a lot of other conservative media outlets and is that they'll bring someone in, they'll establish that expertise, tell me about your experiment, and they'll use that as proof. Any comments on this? Has anyone heard this type of discussion? Will they'll, they'll, They will pull someone in and say, gosh, you don't believe this is actually happening, do you? Any thoughts? Jeff, have you ever gotten into discussion with colleagues over this? Yes, very much cherry picking is, is very real. Um, and, and then I, the other thing that's come to my mind, listening to you, I forget how many years back it goes, but we, we both know Kevin Trenberth here in town and he talked about, uh, you know, he ended up on the, the Daily Show uh, being quoted out of context. And it's on the table to deceive. I think I lost, I lost you at the tail end of that. Was it, was he, um, what, on the dealing show, what was what was the reception of his his opinion? He he did not have the opportunity to talk to John Stewart. It was more the, and I'm I'm thinking it really was that. It's been many years since I I've, I've uh, seen it, so maybe it was a risk to bring it up. But he was talking about the pause and trying to understand the pause, and increased ocean uh, warming, and. Uh, balance between ocean and atmosphere and, and some little nugget takeaway uh, gave the impression that it was awful for the climate community because we don't like this data because we don't understand it. And he's, uh, sorry, I'm not doing a good job of describing it, but no, it no, was no. precisely cherry picking to embarrass someone completely out of context. Absolutely, and, and I, th I think when we jump to conclusions, when we, when we search for um, the information that we want within those algorithmically fed campfires within social media, you can hear this comment a lot. That's not what I've read. And you may have heard that within your own, uh, even across a, uh, a Thanksgiving table, or a Christmas discussion, and the other things. Well, that's not what I've read. Why? Because those opinions, those differing opinions, especially as they're critical of climate scientists, are looking for the results that they want. And that's an absolute violation of the scientific method. So we talked about political party, uh, party Bundling, that was the, the stack that I built behind me, the polarized media outlets. I do not need to get into the background of, of how polarized we are within different media outlets. And I, I think there's even a move farther to the right um, in the enhancement of conspiracy theories with uh, the introduction of uh, a couple other ones, uh, Newsmax, um, OAN, uh, very powerful. So I think there's even a stronger departure from that for the Manipulated manipulation of that political vote. There's the social media media algorithms, algorithms that I was talking about. It's branding, mockery, mistrust, and bias. I tell you, these four words right here 
in my opinion, summarize Dr. Hayward's opening points. Right off the bat, random. Mock them, inject mistrust, and reinforce the bias, reinforce the stereotype. And then I, I, I'm not gonna dance around who's and what's the elephant in the room. It's political gain. It's the oil and gas lobby. And, and that's what's driving this. And it's been a very successful and powerful insurgency. And I'm gonna close out with some of the memes here that, that people share. Here, clap if you think global warming is a hoax, this is big oil. Um, Al Gore has received a, a lot of critique as well. Um, there's an inconvenient truth. I, I'll just go through these rather quickly, but look for some of the stereotypes again that we have. Alarmist. Um, Grandpa, you actually used to believe that people could change the climate. Whew, crazy stuff. And here's that that stereotype as well. Now <laughs> we're using the, uh, the Grateful Dead tie-dye. The Birkenstocks are there with the socks. This is a nice one. I, I, I threw this one in there to, to find some common ground and it would be, uh, be wonderful if we could do that. So a number of other ones as well that are out there. Uh, again, here's that stereotype that's kind of perpetuated. Uh, and really kind of aggressive, insulting. Um, this, is, this is kind of creepy stuff on the, on the bottom left and, and this one is, is equally as disturbing. I don't want to go too long on these. I just keep your eyes open for this, but uh, global warming hoax, to, to, to use the term hoax. Um, this was an interesting one. This actually happened. Uh, we had a senator that uh, brought a snowball into a legislative session and uh, was uh, targeting climate change and declared it a hoax and, and very, very powerful stuff. And so again, Something else probably brought this individual into the voting booth, into that specific campfire. But look at how we can pull these things together. We've, we've merged a scientific concept with a, an economical strategy. Uh, it's really interesting. And this is another slide that just kind of shows how separate we are. Um, I'm gonna put two more links in. I wanna, I wanna stop. Um, First one is Arctic Sea Ice by um, a, a colleague of mine. We were at the Naval Academy together. He is one of the world's experts on Arctic sea ice. It's a beautiful, beautiful visual data set that shows that we're losing old Arctic ice. I want to recommend that you stay grounded, trust the experts. Um, I trust NASA, and I'm certain Jeff does as well. Uh, there's a list of all the scientific organizations and communities that support this. Um, there's evidence, there's causes, there's effects. This is that slide that I showed earlier, some vital signs. So it's, it's not a hoax, it's not at all. And, um, and this is a nice ground floor uh, kind of calibration that if you do get into a discussion with someone, say, hey, listen, this is why I'd like to refer you for the information. Now, they may not want to hear that. I mean, some of those, again, some of those synaptic networks are pretty locked in and they, um, they want to continue to say that's not what I read. And the last one is um, Dr. Jane Goodall, certainly one of the most powerful environmental stewards on the planet. And she presents a, a wonderful case for embracing environmental stewardship and, and also communicating as a global community as well. So I'm gonna put those out there for you and then address any questions. I apologize for going a little long here. No, I no, please don't apologize. That was wonderful. And obviously the insight and obviously, you know, trying to bridge the gap and understanding all the different dynamics of the situation that we're presented with is, you know, we'll go over time as much as we need. So I really appreciate that, Dr. Hager. Uh, one thing that jumps out at me specifically during this talk is the fact that people tend to agree with climate scientists, but also, you know, that cherry picking comes into play because we're talking about weather versus climate. And I don't think people necessarily understand the concept in full retrospect. So um, certainly would love to hear your scientific knowledge on the fact of climate versus 
weather uh, within its oscillations and within its patterns, just as a quick overview before we get to the Q&A section. I, I, I really like that shift of a distribution curve. It does, it's a nice visual representation because what we're seeing is anomalous. And whenever there's an anomaly, as a scientist, you develop a hypothesis, okay? And with that hypothesis, you need to do a considerable amount of background research to develop an experiment to extract data, to have empirical data, you make an assessment based upon that empirical data, and you deliver it to the scientific community, which is an arduous validation and can shut you down at any time. That peer review process is very, very powerful, and it's a complicated process. And Jeff, I'm certain, understands this. And any of you that have maybe presented it at a conference or even published a paper, it is arduous. It's tough. There's a very solid policing system for, for fact and an adherence to the scientific method. And so I, I think it's important to really visualize that this is anomalous. A trending upward of carbon dioxide is anomalous. And what does carbon dioxide do? Carbon dioxide is a powerful greenhouse gas. There are other ones out there as well. Methane is, is a very unique, has a very unique window, but it's 20 times as virulent as carbon dioxide. But what carbon dioxide does in our, in our atmosphere, it's like putting on an extra um, uh, down jacket. You've already got a down jacket on, put another one on. Those carbon dioxide molecules within our atmosphere are selected Dr. Hager, we might have lost you a little bit here. Can you hear me? I lost him as well. Okay. I will certainly retry the connection. I apologize for that. It looks like Dr. Hager lost the connection completely. So we'll see if he can rejoin in just a second. See here, I will certainly try to contact him. Apologize for that. I don't know if it was on my end or what happened there. All right, we got you back. Um, no, not a problem at all. It does look like it was on your end, but just to reiterate what you were discussing, um, you cut out um, about a minute ago. Okay, so the, it, it really comes down to the physics of the thing, correct? We, we mm -hmm. have a selective absorber and you know the, we, we talk about greenhouse gases and one of the things that's always an irritant for me in that, discussion, an intellectual discussion about climate change is even just a description of what's happening with those greenhouse gases. We're not trapping, it's not a, it's not a glass greenhouse, it's trapping the heat in. It's a selective absorption process. So we, the sun heats our planet with shortwave radiation, that's that UV radiation that can burn your skin. Right? It heats up the planet, the planet cools itself by emitting long wave radiation out in our atmosphere, carbon dioxide and methane, acts as a selective absorber. It's, it's excited by that. So it absorbs it and it re-emits that radiation, long wave radiation back. So 
This is the physics of the problem. With more carbon dioxide, the more re-radiation of long wave radiation back to the planet. You just put another jacket on, keep putting jackets on. So unless there's some way to extract that carbon dioxide or sequester it from the, from the atmosphere, the atmosphere is logically going to get warmer unless we have some sort of buffer system. And I haven't read, and Jeff, I don't know if you have either. There's some silent, wonderful buffer system out there. I've read some novels that, that talk about sequestration projects, but uh, I think it's, it's really the fossil fuel emissions that are the, the biggest aggregate. Absolutely. And I mean, I would certainly love to have you on the webinar as well, again, to go over carbon sequestration within soils, within the ocean, things like that. We can go on and on. Uh, to get to the Q&A section, I would like to start off with the specific one that I personally had. Um, and it's, it goes into combating climate change and how do we actually take off another jacket? So besides knowledge and funding, what do you think is the single most important resource in combating uh, this situation that we face, climate change? I'll give you my opinion. Um, certainly. There, there are certainly experts out there that are running models. And, and um, I, I think what we do is we fall back and start trusting the science. Um, I hope I'm, are you saying what is the solution? What, what should we do? I'm saying, you know, obviously, it's very complex, it's multifaceted. So, you know, one of the biggest things is having funding on your side. One of the biggest things is having people actually believe in the science and back it. So regarding, you know, knowledge and funding, besides those two things, what do you think is another big um, overarching theme that would potentially be able to solve climate change? Unfortunately, it's political power and legislative leverage. Um, if we if we're not even a player in the world stage, mm -hmm. um, we we can't possibly uh, plan on getting anything, anything done. And and you know I I I look at someone who is is pro life and they're very passionate about that. And they say the only way that I'm going to get this my single issue overturned is to to fill the Supreme Court with some conservative justices that are going to allow that to happen. That that just that's that's something very. Take care, Victoria. Great, great to have you. Thank you so much. Certainly. Cheers. But I think what what's powerful and what's really going to drive any any uh, future momentum towards doing the right thing and impacting the climate is is that legislative and executive leverage. More importantly than legislative, I, I would say ex executive um, executive power because we have never ratified any climate change agreement in this country. We've not. The only way we've entered into any agreement was through executive authority. Obama brought us in to the Paris, Paris Climate Agre uh, Agreement as an executive order. Donald Trump took us out as an executive order. We weren't even in there anyway. I think it was more of a, uh, a, a stand to really just kind of support the lobbyists that uh, were, were doing that. So um, the there are so many things that we are, are helpless in impacting. And, and I think, as my daughter always said to me, you, 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 you vote by what you buy. And um, it's known as a consumer democracy. You drive the market. And, and unfortunately, I, I think within climate science and a, uh, an adherence and respect for science, it's, it, it's voting and main, maintaining that uh, executive authority. I, I, Jeff, do you feel the same way? Oh, so many thoughts. <laughs> I, I welcome your thoughts. There's both, certainly the politics that you're talking about, and, and uh, we have an administration that took us out of Paris. Indeed, we, we need to see that political will. And, then there's the legitimate debate about whether we can do geoengineering. Some brilliant minds, uh, Freeman Dyson out there before he died said, ah, we just need a lot more trees and we, we can solve this. Or maybe we can pull up, uh, put up aerosols and reflect more of the sun. You know, there, I am concerned from a 
personal perspective that indeed we may have gone too far and that we're past the point where anything but geoengineering will work. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. I think we're, we're at it. We're added a part of it, the addiction that we can't push away from it. Oil and gas reliance and the agricultural industry is very, very powerful um, in, in the, the loss of not only the rainforest, those, you know, that, that CO2, natural CO2 sequestration, right? The overstressing of the carbonate buffer system in the, system in the, in the oceans. You know, I, it, there, there are some critical tipping points that, that are dangerous. And um, I don't know that 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 is going to be a convincing argument. And, and I, I, you know, I throw it out to both of you is that I, um, even the scientific community, I think it's just backed off on trying to get into a political discussion with, with anyone. Um, and, and some would call that arrogance. I tend to disagree with that. That's not, that's not arrogance. It's, it's just, I, I'm, I'm not going to entertain um, a discussion that violates physics. I'm not going to entertain anything that, that um, because unfortunately it just doesn't seem that logic and, and science can serve as a convincer. And, and, and so often you get people into those circles and, and they're just like, I don't believe it. This is not what I read. This is what I believe. You're not going to change my opinion. Why? Because I don't trust you. You know, and then I've, I've heard this one too. This is striking. They're like, oh, wait a minute. Isn't the foundation of science to be skeptical? I said, yeah, at step seven, not at step one. You know, you, 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 you have to come up with some sort of process with a hypothesis, an experiment, empirical data, make it an assessment. But to just be skeptical of an assessment without providing some sort of counter study um, is doesn't make sense. You're driving backwards on the highway. It just, um, it, it's sad. And I, I found with the large population classes that uh, um, you could see people just kind of sit back in, in, even in a classroom, you could see that dynamic sometimes when I, when we get into the, the politics of this stuff and, and they just kind of sit back and go, oh man, this is uncomfortable for me. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist and I'm teaching science. So uh, I apologize if, uh, um, but it, so not to insult or anything. It's just, hey, hey listen, I trust the experts. Trust NASA. And I agree. I mean, some of those conversations can certainly be a little bit more cringeworthy because people put so much emotion into them instead of actually having more of a scientific and professional discussion they're going off of what they were told, what they were raised upon and specific knowledge that they're not looking into or cross-checking with references and sources. Um, so I completely agree how it's very hard to bridge the gap and have a productive discussion regarding this type of issue. Um, so I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Hager. No, 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 I, I couldn't agree more. And, and there is a very powerful divide of the, the voting demographic for um, college educated students and non college educated students. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and my gosh, there's a large percentage of individuals out there that, that uh, don't believe in evolution. I, I was struck by the percentage. Jeff, have you seen that percentage nationally? Those that, that do not believe in evolution? It, it is remarkably high, over a third, I think. I was, I was going to say between. Uh, above 36 or 37 is what I saw. And, and that just is, uh, that's what we're dealing with. You know, that, that's the, the, the powerful um, aspect of it. And, you know, I, I, that falls, you know, right, right in line right here is um, uh, we have people that are praying right now that, that uh, the president can find a way be elected why what drove them into that arena it's it was a, it was the pro-life here as well so it, uh, it's all kind of we the most number of folks who don't think we went to the moon uh, uh on apollo i've even had a cu undergrad student say that and he was interested in technology yep. and, uh, remarkable to me so i i wanted and 
This is triggering thoughts for me over the last number of months, uh, even since the election focused and just reading the book on the age of uh, surveillance capitalism. Uh, this, um, I've forgotten her name already, but it's, a, it's an author featured on the Social Dilemma uh, Netflix show. Um, I have been growingly convinced that social media is our problem. And Could not agree. Yeah, such a, such a polarization. That's where the fire camps are coming from. That's why you're not reading the alternate material because the algorithms don't feed it to you. It was, it was all in your charts. I'm, these days I'm flipping that order a bit more where it really is the, uh, the campfires that we live in. And you know, I'm guilty of it, right? I couldn't make it more than a couple of minutes into your first lecture because it just was painful to hear that material, to know that there are people like that out there. And it's not easy to cross the gap and try to hear controversial material. I'm sure there are some things that that speaker, that first speaker could teach me. I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, 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 how, it, how do we solve that? Yeah, I, I, but the dialogue, in my opinion, should start off you know, you, you, even if you were to present the opposing topics, you spent the first five minutes branding, mocking. And, and so you've already made a circus of the other side. So what he's basically saying is that, guess what? It stopped based on what? What do you, you know, is he showing a, a based upon a study by these five um, researchers of which I was a co-author, uh, you know, and this is what I'm presenting. And again, also when, when results are presented, you, re, you present trend lines and, and you know that as well as I do, you present trend lines, you make an observation on the trend line and then in the conclusion, you can inject something. Um, but it is, uh, it's catastrophically um, effective in dividing as social media is. It's a, powerfully effective. And, and what's even more um, disturbing is that these social media outlets are seen as free press. These are nothing other than um, companies that are making money. And so uh, I, I, I look at uh, how this is seen as, as just some sort of open forum where, where people should be able to, to say what they want to say. Yeah, they can, but it, it's, it's um, it's like dynamite dangerous. And, um, and it, it just further divides us. You know, we can't even get into discussion. I, I, Jeff Jeffries is an amazing, excuse me, stand-up comedian and he talks about gun control. And the fact that in our country, based upon a very, very powerful gun lobby, that we haven't done anything, not even anything, not even a couple little steps. We, we adhere to that constitutional you know, origin of the, the, the Second Amendment. And we are so arrogant in defense of that that we can't find some sort of middle ground. I, you know, I, I think that's the thing that's so, so powerful in um, what's happening even with COVID right now is that, all right, I, I, I understand people may feel isolated and discriminated against and, and restricted uh, as their businesses or churches can go under. But my argument to you is that do something, do something. And it's the same thing for uh, a, a global environmental discussion is just do something to, to set it awash or set it offshore and, and just proclaim it as, as madness and nonsense is, that's the, that's the toxicity, that's the danger that I think you were uh, alluding to is that that's just scary. How do you how do you turn the tide of all those individuals that are now their networks, their their neural networks are locked into mistrust, right? You, you can't send them back to school. And you're not going to convince someone at two in the morning via Facebook. I, Obama brought that point up. Is that you know it's just not it's not a it's not gonna work. 
<laughs> I think going off that point, it's just pinning one another against each other. So off yeah, of the video, we'll it exactly, it's just pointing fingers. So off of the video, he just discredited uh, an entire cohort without even, you know, trying to work with them. He just completely went into it with his own mindset without being a little bit malleable. So it's a little hard. And especially with COVID and it being, you know, politicized now, it's, you know, if you're wearing a mask, you're a liberal. If you're not, you're a conservative. And those have nothing to do with each other because those are basic human rights of healthcare and intrinsic values of, you know, longevity and within your health. So it's these things that we are very much a nation of individuals and we need to come together as a nation together as working for your neighbor and making sure that everybody makes it through this. So it is interesting how those two sides get polarized as in throughout this entire conversation in any certain subject instance, political climate, you know, if it's climate change, if it's the pandemic, anything, it's going to get polarized for specific benefits. Yeah, you would think that something catastrophic like a, a pandemic um, would 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 bring us together. Rachel, you had a question eloquently said, though, Kevin, I, I, I like that insulting of the cohort that the respecting I appreciate that, that our other side is like, wait a minute, for my esteemed colleague who may disagree. Exactly, exactly. It doesn't, you know, we'll never, we'll never completely agree, but at least we can hear each other out. And that goes back to the social media. That goes back to the scientific method of you are supposed to be very strict and, you know, you're not supposed to just be like, okay, I understand that. And we'll go with that. You need to be very critical, but you also need to do so in an unbiased manner. Well said. Yeah, you're a utopian as well, Marin. <laughs> Rachel, you had a question? I do. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm techno. I'm old fashioned. I mean, technology, we're not the best of friends. <laughs> so, got my mute um, off. But I, I did have a question. Um, just with COVID happening and it, the case is increasing and people, people, I don't know. It's just a weird time in general. It's have had, it's had, we've had the opportunity to, I guess, self-reflect on ourselves and just everything we're doing in the world. Do you think that it's actually helped with help, um, helping people, I guess, recognize the issue? Or do you think it's, it's, it's making it worse? Again, this is an opinion. Um, uh, what, can you just clarify that is, or is the, is the epidemic coming Worse, or are you saying? Or, or... No, no, no. Since COVID um, has started, it's had people to like self reflect on themselves and just the rest of the world. Um, it's given people, in my opinion, time to, I guess, notice that the um, environmental changes has become an issue. Um, I just want to hear your opinion on that. If you think that people are starting to recognize the issues more since COVID, or you think that because of social media, it's gotten worse, like people are thinking it's a hoax. Um, that there really isn't an issue. Uh, just that's what, like, um, if that makes sense. I think what's what's really disturbing is the, and and this is I I, I hate to go to the top on this one, but you know we used to deal with random conspiracy theories and we could laugh about them, and now they're they're commonplace within the uh, family discussions, the political discussions, and even even directly uh, in a one way communication from. Um, uh, the executive office and, and saying and injecting these conspiracy theories. So what we're finding is that people are, are not just believing one or two conspiracy theories that are kind of on the outskirts of society, like flat earthers. Now those flat earthers are brought into the discussion. Now um, creationists are brought into the discussion of wait a minute, let's let's start let's start. Um, recognizing that the Bible is in fact a, a textbook and that maybe churches or, or schools should, should start doing that. That's the thing that, that, that really scares me. And it goes back to that political leverage in doing so. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I, I think that we're, I don't know that we're going the right direction um, at all. And, and, and it's unfortunate because, you know, I, I was in discussions with with friends and, and neighbors and, and, and colleagues when this thing first hit, COVID first hit. And, um, and there are still a great many out there that choose to believe that it's not happening and, and that. 
as a society and as humanity, I think that's suicidal. Uh, and that was purely my opinion, Rachel. I'm, um, you, no, know, I, 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 you know, I, we, we, we need to trust the experts. We need to trust people like Jeff and, 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 and say, what is, it, what is your opinion based upon your expertise? You know, I think the most powerful bit of advice I, I, I got when I was a, a young researcher is that build your brain trust that has your experts. So when, when things go to crap, um, you reach out to them. Fauci has been that, that source of information to Presidential Medals of Honor, Medals of Freedom, two of them, for uh, uh, the AIDS epidemic, and so two presidents, and he served. You know, I, I think that we have to continue to, to connect with these experts and get them in the room with the other cohort, Kevin, just like you talked about, okay, let's bring in the economists into the room and say, guys, we got to figure this out. But to, to just push it off to the side is, and, and cause mistrust because I need some sort of political uh, stock market metric um, to use as leverage in, in a rally discussion is, is just, it's just not the right approach. And, uh, and I'm not doing this with the president. Um, and to go off. To go off of that, I believe that it's very difficult for certain individuals to fully have faith in the scientific method without them completely understanding it. Because, for example, during the COVID pandemic, it's, you know, wear your mask, masks work, don't wear your mask, masks don't work. The CDC coming out with specific information that's, you know, ever revolving, them going to now 10 days quarantine instead of two weeks. So, that's the whole thing is individuals don't understand the t scientific method and the process it takes. So it is trial and error. It's a lot of trial and error. And so they lose a lot of faith when people go back on the word and then they say it again. And so it's a lot of this back and forth that people just are getting tired of and they have to have faith and they also have to, you know, it's, it's not a slow or sorry, it's not a short road. It's a slow roll. And um, it's just very interesting to see the, relentless you know perspective of i'm not going to trust it because it keeps progressing and going back and progressing and going back and i don't know what to believe yeah and and, it, and again it's not impacting me right you know i that mm -hmm. um, i was talking to a student who you know i was out in boulder today that had lines outside whether it was trader joe was her rei and other places and she was on the western slope and she said i went to church 150 people i was the only person in, in in the congregation that was wearing the mask. Yeah, so it goes back to what we talked about a little bit earlier is now people, we don't live in this melting pot of political opinion right now. People are going to different areas. They're like, I'm moving away from Florida because I don't, I don't like the people I'm surrounding with. But that's, 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 a, that's a, uh, a self um, segregation for political pockets. So we, we've eliminated the discussion across you know, uh, across the bridge with some of that stuff because people are like, no, this is my camp, and you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna listen to you. And so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm. It, this is some scary stuff. Uh, and, you know, the mistrust of science thing is, it's just scary, Rachel. You know, it's just really scary stuff. It's beyond <laughs> scary, and I mean, I'm. I'm someone, I'm not as educated as you gentlemen, of course, but I love learning about it and I know it's a problem. Um, and that's why I have Kevin as a, as a good friend to help me and tell me what to do. Um, but even my company, like we, we noticed that was a problem. Um, I mean, the, the founders, they're, they're two twins um, and they're amazing. They're young brothers, but they, they know that agriculture is like one of the largest contributors to um, just like global emissions. And that's why we try to do any, everything we can to be economically friendly. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's insane. Um, and it's scary. Like people don't believe it. So to find even companies that are, are believe that believe that it's getting worse um, and that are trying to do stuff to help, it, it's even hard to find companies like that. Well, I think there are sharp companies that are doing it. Um, you look at XL Energy in Colorado. Uh, you look at other, uh, you look at automobile manufacturing. They, oh, wow. they, 
yeah, they see the writing in the wall. And why? Because they they're they they can't, you know, they're not they're not gonna survive, especially as the political climate shifts every once in a while. It's like, man, you've got regulations coming in. That that happens. There's a pulsing of uh, rush out to buy SUVs when the gas is cheap. I'm oversimplifying this as an economic example. And then when gas prices go up, cars are small. I mean, you look at the price of gas. Well, Jeff, take care. It was wonderful to talk to you. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Rachel. Thank yeah, you. thanks so much for coming in. All right. It's been uh, very thought provoking. Oh, thanks. I appreciate Thank that. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, Rachel, I know that they just, they, you have to adapt and, and look, look at the companies that are surviving is that they, you know, they can, they've just got to find a way to adapt. I, I, I walked into a grocery store, a Whole Foods, um, and, and was another store, King Supers as well. And, and they've set up this partitioned area where they're filling grocery bags. Never seen that before. And, and, and so you're looking at a, a revolution in, in distribution where people have to find a different way to do this. And, and um, you know, I, I, have, I have faith in, in, in humanity, but man, I, I do not have faith in, in their um, compassion for the environment at all. I just do not. I don't either. Really, I, it's yeah it's really tough i completely agree because everything that we do as a nonprofit and a small zero waste nonprofit, it's so demoralizing going to the grocery store and seeing so many people still grabbing plastic bags out of convenience or forgetfulness whatever it may be maybe they can't even afford you know the 10 cent bag policy things like that but it just seems like people aren't willing to you know either change their day-to-day -day routine or even go out of their comfort zone to make a change for a better environmental impact. So it's very interesting what incentivizes individuals and what leads people to want to live a greener life and think outside themselves or just their normal routine. So it is very demoralizing um, and it is unfortunate, but on the silver lining, I believe that through all of these, you know, devastating scenarios, innovation is at its greatest because you need to, it's a need and people are going to figure out quickly what needs to happen in order to succeed. Yeah. And I, and, and that, I, I it's, it's unfortunate because I think we're really, we, we've shifted so far back into the fifties mindset. And I, I'm, oh, there's just a couple of things that I've really been very, um, religion is uh, is just an aggravant on so many fronts and, and gets people so passionate and um, you know a, a lack of empathy for the environment just seems to contradict anyone that, that considers themselves a Christian, a Muslim, a, a Buddhist, or anything. It's just it's just counter. To to me but you guys i have to go pick up my daughter oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite right. dr hager i mean it's it is pretty incredible discussion because we went over time by an hour and so that is beyond me that's amazing <laughs> that's that's all, all i right, ever ask good. for is is to in you know have a space where we can have these discussions so i really appreciate you being here and giving us some insight and working through it with us because Obviously, no one's an expert in every single crisis that we're facing. So the more that we can get together and discuss these things and ask questions and openly not be biased and have those hard campfires and try to, you know, connect them, um, all of the above. Um, I can't thank you enough for spending the Sunday evening discussing this with us. Yeah, this was amazing. Thank you. I'm I'm such a geek when it comes <laughs> to anything. Um, I, I just love um, absorbing any type of knowledge. And especially with this, I've been trying to do my own research. Uh, but it's so different when it's an open conversation, especially with gentlemen like you guys. Um, there's no judgment. There's no there's just there's facts. And then you guys have your opinions. Um, I think we all have the same opinions, honestly. But it, it's just like Kevin said, this is such a healthy place to do it. And I uh, we need, we need more things like this in, in a bigger scale, but I, I mean, I could, I could listen to you for hours. So I appreciate this entire time. It's been amazing. Thank you so much.
Cheers, you guys. Have a wonderful evening, okay? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Hager, thank you so much. Yeah. Right. And uh, to conclude, I always like to say, respect your mother and respect each other. Respect your mother, <laughs> respect <laughs> each other. <laughs> Let's have a great rest of your evening. You too. Bye. Thanks, Kevin.